Coming up, one of history's greatest magicians and his attempt to fool Hitler's greatest general. Early in the Second World War, British tanks appeared out of thin air and landmarks vanished without a trace. All the Germans knew there was some strange juju going on in some valley, but we can't find out anything more. It was the work of a master illusionist who never fired a shot, but helped win a war. What was driving him was a need to be a participant. He had to belong. He had to have a role. And all he had to contribute was his knowledge of magic. In 1941, the North African desert was transformed into a stage for the famous British magician Jasper Maskelyne. Instead of entertaining audiences, he was called on to fool Hitler's generals and pilots and to outfox the brilliant German general Erwin Rommel. In the process, Maskelyne turned camouflage and deception into valuable weapons of war. Join us for The War Illusionist. African desert. Endless miles of land as stark as it is unrelenting. For centuries, force has ruled these ancient sands. This day would be no different. It is February 14, 1941, and Nazi Germany's idea of a Valentine rolls into the city of Tripoli with the rumble of mechanized might that would prove to be nearly unstoppable. The Germans controlled all of North Africa except Egypt. If they could take Egypt and the Suez Canal, they could then advance onto the Persian Gulf and take out the major source of oil for the Allies. One commander intends to do just that, General Erwin Rommel. But he goes by a name that strikes fear far into the ranks of his foes the Desert Fox. He soon did such a tremendous job in reversing the war situation in the North African desert that the British themselves attached the moniker the Desert Fox to him. And he got to be a boogeyman, for lack of a better word, for the average British soldier who got to thinking, we can't defeat this guy. For now, it is Rommel's war, and victory is close. But the desert winds will soon conjure up a more than worthy opponent. The fox will soon meet the magician. Real blades. I shaved with this one this morning. And if you'll pardon me, I'll just take my medicine. At the beginning of the Second World War, Jasper Maskelyne is in London performing illusions for which he is renowned. Don't you make me laugh, I shall cut the tonsils out. One of the most vivid ones I remember, because it was probably his most famous one, was the uh, razor blades. He always did it with a great deal of panache. Jasper Maskelyne is one of London's most celebrated performers. His special talent is magic. This is to tie them all together. Magic runs three generations deep in his blood. His grandfather, John Neville Maskelyne, starts the business in 1865 with a friend. They succeeded in uh, getting to London and in 1873 took a lease on the Egyptian Hall. And for the next almost 32 years, uh, they had a theatre of magic there. Then it was demolished and so they moved to St. George's Hall in Langham Place. And there they continued until 1933. In other words, 60 continuous years of magic in London. And that is a record that has been unequaled anywhere else in the world.
But the once packed theaters are now empty, and the magic has gone out of Jasper Maskelyne's act. London faces a menace far worse than anything an illusionist could evoke. The Nazis are on the march across Europe and North Africa. A sense of patriotism and of egotism begins to pull at Maskelyne. He decides he must go to war, if not for his country, than for himself. He was stuck in a world that was destitute, that was desperate, and there were no great stages. There were no great performance areas for him to, to work his craft. I think what was driving him was a need to be a participant. He had to belong. He had to have a role. And all he had to contribute was his knowledge of magic. He had this ability to conceal things when people were looking straight at them. Now, that is the art of camouflage. So his answer was, I think I can get a job in the British Army in their camouflage division. If I could stand in the focus of powerful footlights and deceive attentive and undisturbed onlookers, separated from me only by the width of the orchestra pit, then I could most certainly devise means of deceiving German observers a mile away or more. Maskelyne lobbies the war office hard, signing forms and answering endless questions, only to be rejected. Jasper's mission to uh, use his magic to assist in warfare, of course, was not something that readily was understood by recruiting officers. Furthermore, when war broke out the month, that month, Jasper was 37, which was an age bracket uh, which was not immediately being conscripted. And further, he wasn't in the reserve. So here was this man coming along with ideas they were unfamiliar with. And it took him a long time to break down their resistance until eventually he was accepted into the Royal Engineers. On October 14, 1940, Maskelyne arrives at Farnham Castle in Surrey to attend camouflage training school, but he finds it tedious. He simply doesn't fit in. He was dealing with men who'd been in the army all their lives, men who believed in tradition and the correct way of doing things, and um, they couldn't really see that there was anything to be done by uh, a conjurer. When Maskelyne tries to combine the tenets of illusion and deception with the more traditional camouflage techniques of the day, he is greeted with suspicion. Camouflage was mostly being developed by engineers. And while the engineers are great at building things and implementing things, it takes something of a creative person uh, to develop the new ideas uh, to put into play. And Maskelyne really believed, with justification as it turned out, uh, that he was an original thinker uh, that could basically make camouflage do things it had never done before. Though Maskelyne can't seem to sway his superior officers, he believes he just needs the right audience. When the esteemed Inspector General of the British Army's Lord Gort arrives to review the unit's progress, Maskelyne seizes the opportunity to impress him. Now they would see that his magic really works. He would hide a machine gun bunker using stage magic. He played the audience, his inspector general, just as he plays an audience in a theater. There's the opening, the inspector general's looking around. There's a suspense. There's the moment of kind of disbelief. And all of a sudden, the general is going, I can't see it, but I know it's around here. And whack, this broom handle hits him on the legs. Lord Gort admits to being tricked after running into a broomstick handle that substitutes for the barrel of a machine gun. And he bought it. At that moment, he bought into the magic. Enormously impressed by Maskelyne's tricks, Lord Gort signs him up for duty. 
In late December 1940, he ships off for North Africa. The stage is now set as the Desert Fox and the Magician inch closer to their inevitable showdown. I believed I could vanish batteries, tanks, warships, even aircraft. I thought that tricks could be played on German commanders. Jasper Maskelyne reaches Cairo in the spring of 1941 and desperately tries, but fails, to drum up assignments for himself. His superiors believe he should use his magical powers in a more traditional manner to entertain the troops. In return for performing some magic shows, Maskelyne is allowed to form his own unit. The army calls it the Camouflage Experimental Section. Maskelyne calls it his magic gang. He interviews 400 men, but only a select few would wear the moniker. Men who were not afraid to cut corners or break regulations to get what they needed. He pulled together quite a motley crew. There was a cartoonist from Punch, a stained glass window expert, a pottery worker, an electrical engineer, uh, some analytical chemist, and one who I would imagine was very useful to him, uh, a carpenter, together with uh, a design of stage scenery. These constituted his magic gang. They were undisciplined, unorthodox, and unwanted by the mainstream military establishment, but the magic gang is forged from guts, glory, and pure imagination. They set up headquarters in the Cairo suburb of Abbasia and are primed for duty but months go by with no assignment. Finally, a job materializes. A big job. German bombers are attacking the Allies' most critical supply port in the Middle East. In desperation, British commanders turn to the magic gang. When we come back, Maskelyne and his magic gang make Alexandria Harbor disappear. He says, fellas, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to move Alexandria Harbor. We're not going to hide it. We're going to move it. Jasper's grandfather, John Neville Maskelyne, created one of magic's most famous illusions, an automaton called Psycho that regularly beat its human opponents at the card game Whist. History's Mysteries will return on the History Channel. We now return to The War Illusionist on History's Mysteries. June 1941. The sweltering heat of the Mediterranean sun bears down upon an army of men and machines. This is Britain's chief naval base in the Middle East, and the winds of war bring hundreds of ships to Alexandria Harbor. They are a tantalizing target for the feared German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. In desperation, the British command decides to put Jasper Maskelyne to task and orders him to do a little vanishing trick, make Alexandria Harbor disappear. While Maskelyne is thrilled by the challenge, he knows that if he fails, he and his gang will be sent packing. On June 18th, Maskelyne and his men survey the harbor. 
And they were thinking of the usual ways you camouflage things. Can we paint canvas and put it over the ship? Well, you had hundreds of ships. You had hundreds of buildings. You had several square miles of harbor water. It was impossible. And then something dawned on him that he decided it could be done. He says, fellas, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to move Alexandria Harbor. We're not going to hide it. We're going to move it. Using mud, canvas, and cardboard, hundreds of engineers begin working under Maskelyne's direction to build a decoy harbor of dummy warships at what is then known as Meriut Bay. With a shape similar to Alexandria Harbor and located just a few miles away, the bay stands a good chance of fooling bomber pilots flying under the cover of darkness. The decoy is built specifically for an audience that will be airborne at about 8,000 feet, though it is smaller in scale than the real harbor. Maskelyne pays special attention to getting the perspective right. If you think about perspective, again, if you look at the big illusions that you see on stage, or the grand illusions of vanishing an airplane, those have a lot to do with perspective. It all depends on how you look at it. And Jasper knew that. So what he did was he put his mind's eye in the eye of the pilots, and he built on the ground the perspective to give them the image they needed to see. As a professional conjurer, Maskelyne knows that light and shadow can direct or misdirect the attention of an audience. So he makes sure his set builders light up the decoy to resemble Alexandria's naval buildings. They set out a whole line of ground lights. These were all connected up to Ferris Lighthouse, where they could control it from. Also, into the ground were placed explosive charges, which on detonation would simulate the effect of bombs being dropped. Just four days later, on June 22nd, the stage and its props are ready at the decoy harbor. At the real harbor, a fleet of newly arrived ships brings on a Luftwaffe onslaught. Maskelyne's magic is about to be put to the test. By order, all the lights in Alexandria are turned off, while in Meriut, they are turned on. As the German planes approach, the decoy buildings and ships are blown up via remote control. It's all part of Maskelyne's plan to make the Germans believe they've got the right target and that their flight leader has begun dropping bombs. The German bombers are coming in in a, in a somewhat disorganized way. They're flying at night, which in those days was a very tricky business. The, the average German bomber will say, ah, one of our people has already dropped their bombs because he sees lights which look like Alexandria Harbor. He sees bombs going off. What are you going to think? Go for the bombs. The Germans return to bomb the fake harbor for two more nights. Maskelyne's deception is a success. The war illusionist finds his new stage. And with the spotlight of success come the cheers. The magic gang is in business. People began to whisper, rather incredulously, that the camouflage experimental section could turn out the goods. It seems utterly, you know, simple and obvious, but nobody else had ever thought of it. He did it and it worked. Maskelyne's success proves that decoy installations can be used on a far greater scale than ever imagined. The principles of light, shadow, and dummy structures are used to shelter other British naval bases. Maskelyne's work at Meriut earns him a promotion to major and something else that has eluded him for months. The respect of his superiors. He was basically one of a kind. There was nobody else, you know, in the history of World War II uh, that did camouflage quite the way he did. The Army wants to see what else Jasper Maskelyne has up his sleeve and gives him an even greater challenge to save the Suez Canal. 
The Germans regularly strafe the narrow canal, trying to sink British ships there and render it impassable. The 107 mile long canal is an important link in the British supply chain. Without this lifeline between the Mediterranean and Red Seas, British ships on the way to Egypt will be forced to take a lengthy detour thousands of miles around Africa's southern coast. It's those three things, Alexandria, Cairo, and the Suez Canal that Rommel wanted desperately and Winston Churchill desperately wanted to keep. In fact, he issued an order that we will defend those three places to the last man and the last bullet. When bullets don't work, the army turns to Masculine. He is ordered to somehow extend the range of the 90 searchlights placed at anti-aircraft batteries along the waterway, thus making it easier for British gunners to spot the enemy planes. But Jasper Maskelyne has a better idea. Instead of using the searchlights, which were normally used simply to assist the anti-aircraft guns, he basically used the searchlights to blind the pilots. Now, it wasn't just enough to, you know, um, shine a light in their eyes uh, because they can jink around and they can get out of the searchlight. No, what he did was he turned the searchlights into strobe lights. Then you would send this dazzling set of beams spinning in the air. In fact, they called it a whirling spray. Masculine will hide the Suez Canal in an ocean of light. The basis for it, which in fact had first been seen on the stage of Masculine's Theatre in London in 1885 with a technique known as black art in which a series of lamps facing the audience so that objects behind it are less easily perceived. Though the secret behind the whirling spray remains classified by the British, photographs show it as an array of reflective glass that attaches to the searchlight. As it spins, those precisely arranged mirrors wreck havoc on what was once a single shaft of light. I think I may say, without particular vanity, that the masculines know as much about the deceptive use of mirrors as anyone in the world. But will it work to save the Suez Canal from German attack? When we continue, Maskelyne tests his magic mirror display. They turned on the spotlight and it caused such a dazzling effect that it blinded the bombardier and the pilot and they couldn't see what they were doing. Elsewhere in the world in 1941, in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh and others demanded independence from the French. In Hollywood, 25-year-old Orson Welles directed and starred in his first movie, Citizen Kane. And in South Dakota, the monumental sculpture on Mount Rushmore was completed after 14 years of work. To search any time in history, please visit the World Timeline at HistoryChannel.com. We now return to The War Illusionist on History's Mysteries. It is fall, 1941. Jasper Maskelyne and his unit, known as the Magic Gang, practice magic's black art, but this is no strange voodoo. They fashion a device that will turn standard army-issue searchlights into something much more spectacular and dangerous. They boast that this magic mirror attachment can protect the Suez Canal from German air attack. Now it is time to prove it. 
Maskelyne decides only one man can put his device to the test, and with that, he climbs into an RAF fighter. At 15,000 feet over the African desert, the drama begins. And when they neared the canal, the people on the ground, his Confederates on the ground, turned on the spotlight. And it caused such a dazzling effect that it blinded temporarily the pilot. And they lost cohesion and they plunged toward Earth, and only in the last 400 yards did they manage to pull up to keep from crashing. It doesn't take much more than a near-death experience to convince Maskelyne and the Army that the device is ready for deployment. In short order, 21 searchlights with whirling sprays are set up along the canal. Enemy aircraft fail to penetrate the curtain of light. Many a heinkel of Messerschmitt spun down into the earth when hit by that flickering blaze of light. Now with the Magic Gang's back-to-back -back successes, there is no dearth of assignments. Their next big job comes from the Commander-in-Chief in the Middle East, General Wavell. He wants to deploy a large number of tanks near Alexandria, but Rommel's land and air spotters are a problem. Can the gang make his tanks invisible to the Desert Fox? The desert is a particularly difficult place for camouflage deception because it's flat as a billiard table, generally speaking. It's featureless. There's nothing to block the view. And both sides, most of the time, we're in plain view of each other. Maskelyne must somehow make a tank look like a truck not only from the air, but also from close up on the ground. The camouflage equipment must be lightweight, easy to set up, and inexpensive to produce. Impossible? Not for the magic gag. Soon sounds of hammering and sawing begin to emanate from their headquarters. Within hours, the gang designs a device they call a sun shield. It was, in fact, uh, two frameworks that fitted over a tank from front to back and that split down the centre and effectively converted the tank into an innocent-looking lorry or truck. And this could be controlled from the turret of the tank beneath uh, by pulling a lever. The two sides fell down and the tank rolled out uh, just effectively a metamorphosis, like a butterfly coming out of the cocoon. Maskelyne's sun shield creates the illusion of a truck, but he realizes it will also be necessary to rub out the tank's tracks in the sand. So a spiky chainmail device is attached behind a tank to make its tracks appear to be those of a big truck. Maskelyne positions the camouflage tank in plain view, side by side with several trucks. Neither the officers on the ground nor a pilot circling overhead can spot the tank. Within a few days, General Wavell secretly concentrates what looks like a mass of harmless transport outside Alexandria, opposite an Italian weak point, but is really a tank strike force. The tanks smash clean through the Italian front line, stopping an enemy offensive into Cairo before it begins. Hearing the news, Maskelyne is rightfully jubilant, but not just over Wavell's success. I danced with joy. War magic was coming into fashion at last. And now I knew that this was only the first small beginning of what we could do. When we return, Jasper Maskelyne pulls off his greatest illusion in the decisive battle for Egypt. And I think the size and scale of the battle really gave Jasper the stage that he really wanted to have. His heart was singing, but I'm sure he was scared to death. Maskelyne's father and grandfather held nearly 60 patents between them. One of their inventions was the coin-operated door on pay toilets. Mysteries, Mysteries will continue here on the History Channel.
We now return to The War Illusionist on History's Mysteries. June 21st, 1942. Britain's grip on Egypt is slipping away as Rommel and his Africa Corps capture the port city of Tobruk. Rommel, now a field marshal, pushes the British 8th Army back to El Alamein, 60 miles west of Alexandria. As part of a desperate rear guard action, Maskelyne's gang is ordered to create ambushes to confuse and trap the enemy. With a yes sir, they prepare an unlikely trap. Lumps of camel dung, or any other dung you can think of, donkeys or horses, to put on roads in parts of German-occupied territories. They, they were constructed of explosive. So a truck would see a lump of dung go bang, and that was the end of one truck. The ruse, while successful, is far from being the grand illusion that Maskelyne has yearned for since arriving in North Africa, the one that will truly make the difference between victory and defeat in the desert. That assignment soon comes from British General Bernard Montgomery. He has a plan to beat the desert fox on the sandy plains of El Alamein. Montgomery's Operation Lightfoot must succeed against all odds. The British could not afford to lose. And they were the ones who were attacking. They had to get the Germans out of there. They needed a victory for morale purposes. They could not afford to lose their oil. I mean, it could change the outcome of the war, literally. The Germans, for the same reason, uh, it was their only shot to get the oil. The Battle of El Alamein was a decisive battle because it was all or nothing for both sides. Montgomery decides to launch his attack from El Alamein from the north where the supply lines are located. But the general strategy has a twist. He knew the only way he could win was to make the Germans think that he was going to attack someplace else. So the trick was, how do we fool the Germans into thinking the attack is going to come in the south? And that was Maskelyne's job, and that's what his camouflage was all about. This is Maskelyne's grand illusion to outwit the Desert Fox. In September, with only one month to go before Operation Lightfoot is set to launch, he and the gang work like men possessed. They know that the battle at El Alamein must settle things in North Africa once and for all. I think the size and scale of the battle really gave Jasper the stage that he really wanted to have. His heart was singing, but I'm sure he was scared to death. The biggest drama in which I ever played a humble part was being staged on the grand scale, and villainy was already beginning to know that the final hour of reckoning was at hand. Maskelyne and the gang create the illusion of an army gathering to the south. Dummies of all sorts are planted there. Tanks, guns, aircraft, men, steel helmets, even a dummy pipeline of flattened fuel cans. They duplicated the army that Montgomery had in decoys so convincingly that the Germans actually put their main force opposing the decoys instead of opposing the real army. But Maskelyne is not finished yet. He helps mastermind the operation's key deception, codenamed Bertram. By means of a simple transposition, a real force of 150,000 men and thousands of tanks and guns would be moved in plain view of enemy forces. By October 6th, three weeks before the battle, genuine tanks along with dummies and sun shields are concentrated to the south. The Germans get used to seeing this or that, what they call furniture of the battlefield, and think nothing of it. Then, 
on the nights of October 18th and 19th, the British concentration of men and equipment switches from south to north. They would move tanks with their engine muzzles, creep forward, and get under these hulls. So when the Germans saw what appeared to be trucks, they couldn't see the tanks under there. The Germans have no idea of any troop movements. Simultaneously, the tanks that had left the South were substituted with dummies made by masculines and gang. Late in the night on October 23rd, Montgomery's 8th Army finally attacks as planned in the North. was not only taken by total surprise by this enormous subterfuge by these illusionists, but only had half of his force up there to contend. The Desert Fox is outfoxed by the war illusionist. Rommel held off for two days, committing his reserve to the north when he finally realized he'd been snookered. But it was too late. The German line had been penetrated, the uh, British tanks were on the road, running along the coast. On November 4th, the German and Italian lines give way. Rommel's surviving forces, outnumbered, outgunned, and brilliantly outwitted, retreat to Libya, a defeat partially engineered by a magician. The duel in the desert is over, and the British have their first victory in the war. On November 11, 1942, Winston Churchill praises the operation in North Africa, saying, By a marvelous system of camouflage, complete tactical surprise was achieved in the desert. The enemy suspected, indeed knew, that an attack was impending, but did not know how, when, or where he was to be assaulted. Somewhere in the desert, Jasper Maskelyne surely takes a ball, his grand illusion complete at last. He provided that one extra bit of oomph uh, that turned a stalemate into a British victory. It was the first victory of the Brits over the Germans, and you can't underestimate that. This subterfuge was enormous benefit, saved probably thousands of lives. When we return, magic secrets taken to the grave and the black art, magician Franz Harari demonstrates the wizardry used by Jasper Maskelyne to hide the Suez Canal. Where Maskelyne shot all of his lights straight up, I'll be shooting mine straight out at you. The secret ingredients in Maskelyne's Magic Gang's camouflage paint included rancid flour, cement, Worcestershire sauce, and camel dung that, when added, provided just the right pigment. History's Mysteries will be back on the History Channel. We now return to The War Illusionist on History's Mysteries. The 
The battle for El Alamein is a tremendous physical and psychological victory for the British forces. But Jasper Maskelyne's work is far from finished. Using war magic developed in North Africa, he goes on to work similar wizardry in 16 countries throughout the Middle East and Europe. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to the one and only Jasper Maskelyne. You've got a lovely trick for a razor. You're in here. In 1946, he returns home to England and to his first love, performing. This is where we drop the chopper again. This is exciting. I love doing it. I do really. To give you a little idea of how proud he was of his work during the war, he went to the army and got approval for his whole roadshow to be dressed in British Army uniform. And here is little birdie in the gilded cage. And he told the country very successfully with a good magic show, but variety started to go down as television became more popular and eventually Jasper had to retire and he moved to Kenya where he did a few shows. Though Maskelyne returns to the conventional stage, he does not ride off into the sunset. A conjurer to the end, Maskelyne begins to write the final chapter of his life. But even in his autobiography, he seems to hide many critical details behind a curtain of smoke and mirrors. I guess you could assume that being a magician, he respected the magician's code of ethics, and that is never to reveal a secret. But I think there was probably another dynamic at play, and that is, Maskelyne, being very, very intelligent, was not only a great illusion designer, but he was also a great PR man. And I think he recognized that, like Houdini before, the less he talked, the more other people would talk. And talk they do. Even his own son, the first masculine in four generations to distance himself from the family business, has a difficult time separating the facts from the fiction surrounding his father's life. He was his own best promoter and my father was one of many hundreds if not thousands of clever men employed to do clever things in evasion and escape and camouflage. In his final act, Maskelyne takes the secrets behind his life and work to his grave. He dies in Kenya in 1973 without ever revealing his many war illusions. They remain a mystery today classified as top secret by the British Official Secrets Act and will not be made public until the year 2046. The secrecy surrounding Maskelyne's war magic leaves many to ponder exactly how some of the effects were achieved. Still, the illusion's underlying principles are unchanged since Maskelyne's day. In fact, the basic idea for his whirling spray, the device used to protect the Suez Canal from Luftwaffe attacks, is over a century old. It is called black art and involves the manipulation of light. It is a method of camouflaging one surface against another and by creating a uh, a light field, he was able to dilate the eyes of the pilot and in doing so create what's called a black wash, basically making the Suez Canal become invisible. Under the dark California skies, magician Franz Harari intends to make a row of tanks disappear using the method of black art practiced by Jasper Maskelyne. Key to the illusion are two portals each containing over 300 high-power aircraft landing lights. For Maskelyne shot all of his lights straight up, I'll be shooting mine straight out at you. By using these light portals, you'll see how the simple manipulation of light can completely change an environment. 
The lights are first positioned facing the tanks, so they're easy to see. But then with a very simple move, more specifically, turning the lights around and shooting them at the audience, you'll see how very quickly your eyes dilate and you lose that sense of depth perception. All right, gentlemen, take your places and prepare to rotate the aircraft landing lights. In three, two, one, make the rotation. The area behind the portals becomes a black wash and the tanks appear to have vanished. For Jasper Maskelyne, the beauty of the illusion was always in the eye of the beholder. Whether it was a Nazi bombardier looking down from high above, a field commander tricked in the North African desert, or a fan catching his magic act. Whatever he did and however he did it, the magician did it with style and with imagination. Nobody had an inkling of how, how critical his efforts were. He was a secret weapon, uh, if you want to call it that, for the British, and the Germans never really caught on. The CIA and intelligence people, they know about masculine, and they always worry that the other side will have one. As a performer myself, I understand that really what it's all for is entertainment. But masculine took it to another level. Masculine actually applied his art form to save lives. And how do you put a value on that? That's real magic. Hollywood executives are confident that Jasper Maskelyne will also be magical at the box office. Paramount Pictures has announced plans to make a big-budget movie called The War Magician, with Maskelyne being portrayed by Tom Cruise. Jasper Maskelyne himself tried to sell his story to various film producers, but he was 30 years too early. Now, here's what's coming up next time on History's Mysteries. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com.